Good evening and welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Today we have Dr. Robert from the Blow Monkeys. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, been a crazy couple of years for all musicians, but everyone's getting out. They're touring. Uh, in 2021, you put out another album and um, it's really good. And you haven't stopped, actually. Once you guys um, took a break in the, from you know, you know the long time you guys were together and then 207, right? You guys got back together for a union. And you guys have been pumping out new albums ever since. Yeah. Um, well, that's the job description. You know, that's what we do. We make records. We're rubbish at making cakes and things like that. Although we did try. I haven't stopped even in the even in the kind of interim period where I was doing solo albums. I sort of and sometimes people weren't listening. Other times they were, but I just kept putting them out anyway because that's what I do really. Right. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. What I acknowledge about, that. You know, getting back together was very much about making new music. That was really important to me. Which I think is important. I, I, I was going to acknowledge you have solo stuff too. It's, uh, everything's on, on actually on the website. Solo stuff, regular stuff. There's Patreon. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what I was going to say is, not every band that gets back together is so prolific in putting out new music. You know, some people are like, I have to put out new music, and some artists will just do the same songs because it's not financially feasible. Yeah. And some, some artists are like, it doesn't matter whether it's, it makes sense or not. I have to keep well, creating. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever works. I mean, I'm, uh, it's just, it's just the way I am. I mean, I write a lot. Um, I, I, I kind of, that's how I live my life. I, I love recording. I love putting out new records. Um, mm -hmm. And I love putting them in the set. I love, you know, I, I don't really want to be in museum piece, you know. Obviously, there are things that we play when we play live, which, we have to play and which we want to play, still enjoy playing them, you know, digging your scene or whatever it is. Yeah, but um, for me, it's really important to feel alive, you know, in the moment. And so I've still got plenty of things to say, plenty of things that I want to express. So as long as there's an audience, as long as people somewhere are listening to it and enjoying <laughs> it, then it's worth doing. Well, I agree. I, I'm one of the people that likes when an artist I listen to has new music out. I want to hold it against them because the world is a crazy place financially, but as a fan, knowing there's going to be a new album out and new music and the set's changed up, it's very rewarding, you know, as a fan too, I think. Um, yeah, I'm a fan too. And when I, you know, there are people that I instantly check when they've got a new record out. And, right. I, and I, I, you know, I know um, some other bands, maybe even bands from our era, there's not many people that are, are doing what we do in the same way, but that's fine. That's, that's the way they want to be. I kind of never entered the whole thing with that in mind of becoming a kind of nostalgia act or being caught. Well, obviously we're seen as an 80s act. Right. Because that's the time that we came to, to kind of public imagination, but I never thought of ourselves as that. You know, we just, we just a band, we make music and I'm just a writer, not right. specifically from one particular era or decade well, i think with 80s and it, i hate labels but too but i think when we say an 80s sound to me it sounds positive because 80s had some of the best i think it had the most best amounts of, of pop music collectively because everybody sounded different and it was still pop music it wasn't you weren't counting it you're, you're, you know the beats or compressing everybody did their own stuff you know you could have b52s and you and then you know prince and, and men at work and all everybody sounded differently but it was all yeah. just pop you know what i mean and, yeah, yeah, and I, 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 it was. Yeah, it was a. It was an interesting. I mean, there were things about it that uh, that I struggle with. You know, in terms of the production values of that era. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, the kind of lindrum everywhere, and the, and the kind of big snare, and you know, the record companies used to say, "Oh, you've got to have that hall and oats snare," and of course, so everybody <laughs> had that fucking hall and oats snare. But I mean, um, so but there was a there was a kind of. Uh, freedom and an imagination at play there which uh, which i really liked and also kind of the influence the beginning of hip-hop and rap culture and all that yeah. entering, into pop, entering into pop music so uh, whereas now it's yeah it's, it seems to have become a little bit more homogenized not homogenized formalized so that you it know does. you know exactly what you're going to get because people totally they, they they're kind of playing they're kind of building music based around the algorithm a little bit. Uh, and instead of just, you know, someone like Prince is obviously the guy, like in the way that Bowie strode the 70s, Prince yeah, did that in the yeah. 80s. He, he just, he, he was brave enough to let his imagination flow and take him where he wanted musically. So you end up with something special. 
which is yeah obviously him fighting record companies just it's just another way of him fighting back besides his music because he was going he's going the creative way which is yeah. fantastic and, and i don't think um like a newer version of a band like yours nowadays would have done as well we're still pl- being hung out it, 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 it says something when bands have been playing for 20 30 40 50 years you know what i mean and still doing it that says a lot about your songs i mean some of the 80s as, as like parachute pants no it's about music in the 80s was very um it was consuming and it was catchy and it felt good and people like to feel good you got some good yeah. you know a lot of talented musicians you know and it was it, it supported the creativity which allowed you guys to, you, your sound evolved a lot you know over time without you didn't lose your, t- yeah, you didn't lose your sound yeah yeah it changed a lot i mean i was i was very exposed i was living in london i was very exposed to kind of I lived with a DJ actually, um, and by the record shop as well in, in a part of London called Brixton. So it was very, there's a lot of uh, West Indian culture, a lot of black music was coming in. I was very much influenced by things that were going on and things that were changing. So we probably moved too fast for our audience in the 80s, I think, you know, to be like really, really big. I mean, if you want to be really, really big, you keep making the same record for a while so that people know who you are and then you keep doing that. Whereas we kind of changed a little bit. Um, too fast for that kind of mass consumption, I think. But um, I was just being honest to who I was and what I was listening to, and I tried to, I tried to incorporate things that I was hearing, but but make the miles, you know, make make. It's always kind of my words, my singing, my my songwriting on top. I bet a lot of people that went for more for the the popular way. I bet you, I can think of some bands. I'm not going to mention them. They didn't last in Ivor anymore. They may have had a couple more hits than you. But now they're not doing music; they're doing something else because you know <laughs> it toppled yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot to be said about being true. You've got to love it. You know, you've got to love. I mean, when 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 the when the whole support network falls away, as it inevitably does, because bands tend to have a kind of imperial period. It might be three years, five years, and you're getting yeah. all the cars turn up and take you everywhere, and you're doing everything, and you're on top of the pops, and you're touring the world, and then that falls away inevitably, almost for everyone except for like, you know, the stones and all that. So then, and then you're presented with the the question about, that's kind of separates the men from the boys in a way, because that's all you have then is the music. Yeah, your legacy. And yeah, and the the structure falls away. So you ask yourself, what's important to me? Well, in my case, I mean, I've often said this, but it's true. I started off life when I was a teenager, busking on the street. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've often thought that maybe that's where I'll end up <laughs> with a kind of journey in between. And would I do that? Yes, I would do that because that's really what I do. I'm a, that's what I love doing. I love playing guitar and singing. Mm-hmm. And so I just find a way of continue to do that. I've been lucky in the sense that I've had a bit of success and I'm able to do that. But it, for most of the time, it's you know you really got to fight Great. just to be heard. I find it interesting if you talk about the evolution of your sound, and I'm familiar with some of your solo work too. Uh, Eighty four was your first album, uh, uh, living, "Living for a Generation," and then to twenty one, twenty twenty one is, is "Journey to You," and in, in between, you also do a lot of solo music and work with other separate artists. So your songwriting craft has probably changed a lot, and you probably honed honed into what you like, what you don't like at this point. The challenge of going from like your first album to, to, to what you do now, do you find it's easier? Do you feel like you know what you want in the process? Have you changed it a lot over the years? Yeah, I mean, I it's like an, an old footballer. You, you sort of do what they said, that you do the first 10 yards in your head, man. I mean, I, I kind of know, I know a good idea from a bad one very early on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can kind of construct it in my head uh, almost completely now. Whereas when I was starting out limping for a generation, I had no idea what I was doing. I had, I was such a novice. I had no, I, in my head, I wanted to be like Backward and David, you know, which has always been the blueprint for me, that kind of classic songwriting with the very clever key changes and the very, although, you know, they're seamless, they don't sound like clever key changes. But I, right. I didn't, mine, mine, were, mine were much more clumsy than that, but there was something in there that wanted to get out. And uh, so um, I look back on that now quite fondly, really, because I couldn't write songs like I wrote on that first album anymore. That's, that's, you have to be kind of a little bit naive, I think, to, to do that. 
You know, another, another big influence for me, I think, was love forever changes that kind of orchestration and the and the, the yeah there was there was definitely something in there as well but that was in my head but i had i didn't have the tools to get the sound i had in my head like out i was just, sound I was just i was just making out as i went along you know well that's what but, i mean i don't mean about you know growth is important that's what we're talking about but you going into a studio like you writing songs you know in your new band new bands have no idea what they're going to do with the sound and you're at you know whoever your producer is or whatever you're in their hands. I want something, you know, a lot of first is like, that's not what I sound like. That's not what we want to sound like. Yeah. But as you get later in the game, you you have a good idea of what your sound that you're doing now. Yeah. Before the studio is going to happen and what can happen in the studio. I mean, obviously yeah. things keep changing, but you have an idea when you write a song now, you're like like part of your songwriting, you're like, oh, it's not going to work in production. I like it here acoustically or whatever. And it might be okay to small setting, but to the song recorded, you know, it's not going to be the same. Yeah. I mean, I made a real conscious effort early on to, learn what's going on in the studio. Because I did have that thing when, I, when the first time I said, well, what the hell happened to the bass drum and the bass? <laughs> Why has it disappeared? Because of the producer we were using at the time. Not a bad thing, that was just the way he did it. Uh, so I, I, and then and then computers started to come in very early on, very basic ones, but some somebody was then doing this and I was thinking, well, I'm losing control. I've got the, I've done a demo. I know what I want the song to sound right. like, but, but it's not, it's not coming up back at me like that. So I had to learn what everything does. And I'm a bit of a nerd that way. I don't mind sitting down reading a manual. <laughs> so I sat and read and I wanted to learn. So I got into samplers very early on and compressors and everything that was, that was going on because that's part of the creative process really, because if you do, otherwise the song gets hijacked and ends up being something, something that you yeah. don't recognize, you know? I, I agree with you, and I actually went to school for recording, so I'm, I'm just a nerd that actually, you know, early on went to my, you know, learned how to record, so yeah. the world changes, but I'm not doing it now, but the world changes, but my point is, I love that too, even to this day, you know, I'm listening yeah. to certain sounds and certain bands, and it's all the bands up from like, you know, the 50s up until really, I don't know, 90s, 2000s that are still the ones I listen to the most, because there's more in the songwriting than in the programming. Yeah, Take, taking out electronic dance music that's different I'm talking that's about singer song and, and that, that again even that though there's an attitude that I really like on that you know my son was showing me something is this is kind of Kato Kato that was kind of South African dance music that these kids were getting secondhand phones and using Fruity Loops which is a very basic drum machine thing yep. that comes, comes inside them and they were making these tunes and then they were distributing them by WhatsApp uh, but I'm talking about 15,000 people on a WhatsApp group, you know. So this Ooh, was what's really, that? Yeah. So this is like a real punk ethic. This is really how it should be. Right. And I thought, what a fantastic way to do it. You know, you're, you're taking the technology and making it work for yourself. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I often freak, because I'm, I'm a massive fan of mono, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I go into to a studio now and it, some young engineer will freak out because I say, no, I want the drums in mono. I don't want this kind of out here, super hi-fi clarity. And I play him an Eddie Cochran record and say, hear those drums, that's what I want. <laughs> yeah, there has to be an excitement and an attitude to it. That's interesting. For me, okay. any, for me anyway, because I wasn't, I don't like smooth. Although we are perceived in a weird way as being quite a smooth 80s, something, something it says in Wikipedia, a uh, sophisticated pop, whatever that is, I don't know, but I certainly. Don't I would say it. lush. I say I, I, to me, I hear a lush sound, and that that maybe a lush, of, yeah. But and, and that's like your voice. Your voice is something in your voice that's very lush. Is what, that's yeah, how I hear but, it. Yeah, yeah. There's a there is a certain. Yeah, I understand that. But the music itself, I wouldn't say that because it changes so much drastically. If you really listen to it, if you don't know the music and you just want to like you know throw it all together but if you actually understand the bands the records and you know the lineage it does not all sound the same yeah no yeah T to me I, you know, there's a difference you take the time to actually listen to the band it's totally different each album yeah. is different yeah. you know um yeah there's, you know, nuances so. well yeah I, I think so was it so when you guys when you went and took a break i'm sure there's lots of band problems or whatever you need to break and then you got solo. Was it different when you came back being a solo artist, back to being in the band? Like, was everybody just refreshed? 
Did everybody kind of have a better idea to appreciate or miss the band? You know what I'm saying? Is there all these different re- reasons why you guys get back together? I'm glad you're together and you stay together. The- yeah. Listen. Yeah. I mean, I missed being in a band, to be honest. I mean, there was not a bad, there was nothing drastic when we, when we first split up. It was just, we'd been together 10 years. It felt like the right time. Everyone was kind of having kids. We'd moved out of London. It was the end of a kind of era. It felt right. like that. And there were new things coming in, Stone Roses, Happy Mondays, that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it felt like, no, we're not, I don't, I don't want to hang. I want to do something else. And then you fast forward sort of 15, 16 years, uh, and I, in that time, you know, I, I had become a better musician because I, yeah. I'd been playing with a lot of other people. I'd been writing lots, but I, but I still I missed being I missed the camaraderie of, the, of that being in a band. And I thought, well, there's no point in forming another band. We've got a history. Let's do it. Let's just make sure we 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 do new songs. So it was, uh, you know, it was um. It was, it was, yeah, we came back as adults rather than kids. Right. It sounds very healthy. It sounds like, like, you, like you dated somebody in high school and you guys broke up for, as friends and then met them later on in life after you've dated other people and you've grown up and there's a whole new, better well, version of you. I mean, you know, the thing, it, it sounds healthy. From my point of view, it was. I mean, the thing is, I nobody so. ever talks to the other members of the band, so I never know. Then I don't think anybody has ever interviewed the three other guys in the band. So they might have a different point of view. But um, <laughs> but I think I think they would agree that we all we, we're we're quite cl- we're quite family now we're quite close although we don't mix outside of it but we do have a kind of a kind of telepathy on stage and a kind of feel that when we play together and a shared history which is worth something I guess it is it is yeah so. The way um, things are right now, so with COVID, you guys couldn't do a lot of touring. Nobody, nobody really could do anything. No. Were you working on even more music for later on down the road? Because I mean, you just have a new album out. You really haven't had a chance to really work it yet. But while you still had downtime, were you kind of like just stockpiling more songs or what? Well, I'm always writing. I've always got bits and pieces on the go. But we, I'm really enjoying playing Journey to You live. And we're about to go out again in and play a little more in July and then again in October. And we're, we're sneaking more and more of those songs into the set because they really feel good. Yeah. So um, I think I think Journey to You is a a bit of a a, a high watermark for us in a, in a way. I think it's so so in the meantime I've done a new Monk's Road album. Yeah. Where, uh, where I've I've done uh, I've I've got a single coming out from that actually in uh, in July and I've also got a co-write with Paul Weller, which he which is being released as a single in September. That's pretty cool. So that's coming out. That's got about eight of my songs on it. And also I recorded an album, an acoustic album, with a guy called Matt Dayton. Uh, and that is coming out early next year. So yeah, there's there's plenty going on. As far as the Blow Monkeys goes, I'm, I feel that I've got to, I've got to take a step back because Journey to You was I was really happy with it and I thought and and it feels good to play it live. So I think yeah. I think legs yet i think we want to get out and, and let that one give it its best chance as possible well i think you should um yeah you have a challenge to to up that one now it's, it's just a good solid yeah album. yeah i think there's only one way to go which is in a different direction and in terms yeah. of that kind of orchestral baccarat david soul low monkeys sound i think that's I, I, that's it in some way so i think if we're going to do something again next I'll take it in another direction and really piss people off. <laughs> has it, well, with breaks and everything, has touring over there been kind of hard? Like, yeah. Well, it was hard. It was, yeah, I mean, it was hard because, I mean, I'm in Spain, but they all live in London. Okay. Um, yeah, it was tough. It was tough. And then, and then we had a little a kind of hole in, in 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 october last year where we went and we played and everybody came because everybody had been locked up for two years mm-hmm. and now they're kind of going through a bit of a cost of living crisis uh an economic crisis so people have, yeah. you know a lot of festivals are closing down a lot of people are struggling to find that little extra bit of money to come to gigs but i i really enjoy it, the whole process of playing gigs now because i'm totally aware that it's finite yeah and i really uh, whereas, you know, all the mundane things about playing gigs, getting in a van, staying in a hotel, backstage, sound checks, blah, 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 all the stuff people moan about, I love. Yeah. I love it now because it's, it's a buzz. And 
that's just I love walking into a venue, especially whatever it is. It could be a big, it could be the Albert Hall, it could be a, a, the back room of a pub in a, in Northern Scotland or something. I just love the whole thing about it because it's yes, yeah, it's, it's an honor and a buzz to be able to play music to people. It really Do you is. think that's a, a one of the few positive things that's come about from this? Is it was it was a reset button for for musical artists. And it's interesting, a lot of artists have refound the love for touring again. They've appreciated the times. Some of them have actually been able to find their other superpowers, whether it's cooking, gardening, you know, writing, other careers they've started. You know what I mean? They know they, they've reestablished themselves in their, in their families, <laughs> their parents, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. it's been a really good, good checking point for everybody to be like, okay, there are other things in life and this is really fun. And, and now it's, you know, it's always going to be- Yeah, I think, and, I, think and, I think that's true. I think it's- the break has, has put things in perspective. Perspective, people. yeah. And so I look at now and think, yeah, it's a really, it's quite an honor and quite a fun thing to do to play music to people for a living. Or to, to, to you know, and to step outside of that for a little while was, um, was an interesting experience. You know, I just did what, for me, what, you know, I'm a bit of a hermit to be honest, I've always been a little bit like that. So to lock myself away in this little studio here and just start writing an album wasn't such a big deal. Um, I, I didn't, I, I, I don't, I can go for months on end just concentrating on what I need to do. I'm not saying that's necessarily healthy, um, but that's what I've done all my life. So it wasn't such a massive change. Right. Well, the other thing is, I mean, well, you're also not in the same area with your band, so it's also limiting to begin with as it is. Yeah. But the break has been good for everybody. And I think fans are still going to come out for, for, and, and get into live shows because it's almost like they, they, they say, this is, I need this, this money to be spent on, on music and on the artists. That's probably what the show is about was promoting artists to go to their websites and merchandise and support the artists. Originally that's the goal of the show, just to support everybody. And it's evolved to promote them now and your stuff you have going yeah. on. Yeah. So people could, but I think a lot of fans, because you know what? I don't have a lot of money. Maybe I don't need to go buy a pack of cigarettes. I need to go out and see a show because it's reminding the fans how much they could show <laughs> just as much as the artists are playing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think the fans are happy to, to go out and enjoy their music live. I mean, I remember the first yeah, time I heard I mean, music live since COVID. Oh my God, my mind was blown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's, I think there's a, <clears throat> it's a, it reminded us that we need, we need those kind of communal experiences, yeah. And music, especially, can 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 heighten those experiences, can enlighten you. And it's often not about the audience and the guy on stage, the guy or the girl or the band or whatever. that. That's they're like conductors, right? It's coming through like them. a conduit. Like a conduit. Yeah, it's like a conduit, and 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 you create the atmosphere, and and, and if you, and sometimes you get what the Spanish call duende, which is the moment when when things are transformed and you're transported and, and the music helps you do that. But it's often not about seeing the star or whatever it is on the stage. You're just, you're just there to, to, to be the conduit to make this whole thing work. And that human experience, that human need to, and it, you know, get to get, it can be a football match, it can be whatever, mm -hmm. but there's something about that, especially with music, which is, which is you know, enlightening. And, and we missed that massively with COVID. It showed us what it is to be human. We need each other. We need connection. One of the things I see, though, it could be a potential problem is new music, touring music, because you get a lot of people, a lot of the younger generation, not begin with their own playing out because you can be on Instagram or whatever and have 50,000 followers and play acoustic guitar in your bed. But they're not going to be playing a club. You know what I mean? It's a Ooh. new version of people that are like, which is fine because some people don't want to perform live and it's scary or whatever. And I, I get mm. that. Mm. But as everyone else has been playing live, it's enjoying it right now. They're all getting older. I'm getting older. All of our generations are getting older now. There's yeah. going to be a certain point. I mean, luckily the, the stones has raised the bar for a lot of people. So you got some more good years for a lot of everybody else, yeah. you know, but there's gonna be a certain point if we need some more young blood going out there playing, not just shooting videos on Instagram or Facebook live or whatever, yeah. which is the yeah. good during, during COVID. It was good. But now, you know, you need some more young bands in the venues. Otherwise, it's going to be a point where it's just going to die off. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, 
I mean, the, the, you talk about bands. I mean, bands are a rarity now. I mean, in, exactly. in, 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 in the UK, you know, I think the last band that I remember really coming through were like the Arctic Monkeys, you know, from yep. a kind of working class uh, perspective because, because they can't afford to do it. I mean, it's very difficult economically. And, uh, whereas when we were growing up, we could be on the dole for a few years. We could, we could kind of hide for a little while and get our shit yeah. together. Um, we were lucky to do that. So I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, but people will always find a way if that's their calling, if that's what they really want to do. And that, that, that thing about playing live will always be really important. You'll never be able to replicate that, I don't think. I just, I'm saying, we might all go out as, you know, we could do an ABBA and go out as avatars. I mean, you know, that's fine for some people, but, you know, I think it's, uh, I don't think it's in danger of dying off anytime soon. I think just challenges because that, and I also think because of like Brexit, or just like when people come, you guys, if you wanted to, from any other country, you wanted to come to America with a couple, couple of two or three band members, you know, the visa is, in, is insane, like 15, 20 grand, just to get your, your visa over to America, you know. To be a touring band over here from another country, it's really expensive and it's hard. It'd be cost prohibitive yeah. unless unless they get yeah. a really big big deal. Yeah, you know. So, so that's that's one of the challenges right there. And, and there's really two markets: it's America and then like the, in Europe, those are the two bigger versions of the markets for most bands, not yeah. all of them. And then with Brexit and way Europe's dividing up right now, as far as the touring bands, it's gonna be other expenses that they don't need. Yeah, if you're struggling, you were struggling being as it was, you know, sharing a sandwich or something. Now you got to worry about getting, you know, passing another border, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. It's, it's a backward step. I mean, the world in that in that way is going backwards, you know, right. especially here in Europe. You know, we've got, I, we've got a war going on, man. We've got Brexit, which is a complete disaster. There's no, there's no, you know, these Philistines that are running the show, they, they're kind of psychopathic kind of uh, leaders, you know, the Boris Johnsons. Not a million miles away from Trump, not a million miles away from Putin. You know, they all have something yeah. in common, these kind of people. And they don't understand the value of culture. They only understand that they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. They really, and so we are, we have got, we've got it, we, you know, it's a, it's a bad time um, because, um, and, and we need artists and we need musicians yeah. and, and everybody to, to, to fight the good fight to save us because this is, other, other, because if we don't, we will lose this. Yeah, you're right. I agree. I agree. I mean, that makes to it me. Sense. It was that was one of the best things about Europe is everybody could travel back and forth. Oh, it's a nightmare. You know, so, but because that, that's that, that's what makes you have like a community or, or the tribal experience because everyone in Europe can go in between each other. This is brings it to me is like like needing passes to go from every state now in America, like you go state to state, needing permission yeah. and paperwork, which would be insane. Nobody would go anywhere. Yeah, which would cripple economies, and it makes you very supporting yourself and it becomes you know it's not good and no, and no one would sure it's awful it's absolutely awful and you know especially in britain um you know and they've been lied to they've been duped they've been they've been tricked and they've been, you know and it's an emotional reaction it's an emotional reaction to some kind of imagined past when we were great and somehow we're going to get that back if we, you know, we can have the right coloured passports and put the Union Jack up on this and that. Somehow we'll get it all back and we'll be like we used to. It's 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 a not nostalgia trip. It's not based on reality. Um, and it's and you know it's easy. People are easily manipulated because the internet is everywhere and it's in everybody's phone and it's in everybody's life. So it doesn't take much for. Cambridge Analytica or, or Boris or, you know, um, Putin or anyone to interfere with the democratic process. I mean, Brexit was a 48% versus 52. That's a very narrow margin and it's easily manipulated, which it was. So, um, you know, we, yeah, we've got to watch out for democracy because it, it's under threat. Yeah. You know, we, we, need, we need more never to be together not 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 retreating into our petty nationalistic kind of pig pens so yeah no i think i think you know and, and that's always that's always motivated me musically to want to get out there and play because that's well, that was, you know that's sorry. part of the deal is that you is that you talk about these things as well one of the things i always thought for all types of music in, in, in europe was like 
all the different festivals or any type of music, but people come from all around Europe and be united together from all oh, from this one, this country, this country, because there's no borders really at some level. You know what I mean? Yeah. That kind of freedom allowed a lot of other people to be friendlier and friendlier and friendlier. You know what I mean? There's no lines. Now it's like, we bump into somebody from Germany if you're from this other place because, you know, or, or, or the countries with all these borders now. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to dissolve relationships. It's, it's going to separate. It's, it's, it's idiotic. It's only an accident of geography that you're born anywhere. We're all right. the same. It's absolutely absurd. But it suits their purposes because that's, there's, it's the old divide and rule. That's how they keep, that's how they keep things in place, the power structures that suit them. So, they need uh, at least a, a traveling musician's passport or something, some kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, there are, there is talk about that in the. UK. I mean, I think there's a certain level, there's a threshold of so many days that you can travel in Europe as a musician without having to fill in a car name with every bloody guitar pick on it and every like we used to in the old days. But they don't make it easy. I mean, we've done a couple of gigs in in Spain, uh, festivals and things like that. It's it's. It's it's not easy, you know. They certainly don't. And and and, and going the other way, but you know, European acts going into Britain, um, and you know, we're we're kind of we're duping our kids. You know, they're not getting the same benefits that we had. The idea that you can move around and work in other countries and mm. look at other cultures, and you know, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. Backwards. It's backwards. I mean, you... step, it's a really backwards step. I mean, look how hard it was. Like no one looked over to America and saw how hard it was for European acts to get over here if they weren't making money. So clearly that model yeah. is really hard to begin with. So why would you do it over there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, exactly. it's crazy. Yeah. So I want to encourage people to check out your album. But before we end, I want to talk about your, your website. It's, it's, it's great. It covers all of your albums, solo and, and the band. But you also, yes, a new year now. So you're doing some Patreon stuff. Yeah. What, uh, what inspired you to finally take the jump? <laughs> Um, well, I was talking to somebody, a, a, a friend, actually Lloyd Cole does it, and he said that he, and so I had a look at his, and I thought, well, you know, I've got lots of stuff, and I write lots of stuff, and I've got, it felt like a good way of just connecting again with, with the fans. I've got mm -hmm. lots of, I quite enjoyed doing the little tutorials about how to play and I've got lots of demos and unreleased songs and it just seemed like okay well this is another way of connecting right because everything else that I do now it really comes from from me I don't I don't have a record company or a press agent right. or anybody so it's all through it's all you know it's our own record company so uh, you know it's everything is through us so it's just another another layer of independence um which sounds really exciting to be an artist this past 10 years i think a lot of artists they had the label and they felt they had to do the record company thing no matter what even though they, like it was like um you know a good bad thing and they're learning now with this new model like you are like you're doing you know a lot of the bands just one member of the band that books the tours is you know they all agree on this and they said you know they'll make the album and then they'll find somebody to help distribute it they're totally in control of everything you know yeah you yeah. may sell less t-shirts, but you get 100% of the profits back for your t-shirts, except yeah. for the venue taking a part of the profit out of that. Um, yeah, which they do, yeah. And I, can't, I, mean, I never knew that. I can't believe that's really a kick in the shins. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, they yeah, they try. Michelle, our manager, also my wife, sometimes takes them down and they don't get... But yeah, no, they've tried this. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I like... I mean, we use things like Bandcamp as well, which yeah. is... Set to, you know, I love Bandcamp. Bandcamp I go over there all the time and I support it because I believe it. I, I like the Patreon. I like I the Bandcamp. I like buying things on Bandcamp from bands that I like, right. you know, as well. Or Ed Cooper, like the guy from the Saints, and, and or somebody that I want to support. It feels like the ethical choice. Right. Um, and so, so I, it's just another layer of that. And Patreon, I've, I've only really just scraped the surface of the ideas. I think there's something that will grow. But it's just another way of communicating directly with people that want to hear from you and that want to listen to the music. And if you can build that up to be enough people, it makes it sustainable. So at this point, I have no desire or, um, I mean, no one's gonna, no, no major label's gonna come in and sign us anyway, but I have no desire to get involved with any labels anymore like that. Because I know how to do it myself. If I want to put a new record out, I can put up a Facebook or a 
Twitter or a, a, a newsletter, and I'll hit people that genuinely want to know about it. Right. It, and I'm not. It's not some random ad in a music paper, costing lots of money, and you're just hoping <laughs> someone might see it. Which you know. So uh, you know, obviously, that's there's an empowerment in that. I think. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and then you know, and then there's Spotify. But I, the way I look at Spotify is that it's uh, it's good publicity. I mean, you. Right. you it's hard to make a living at Spotify, but you know everybody uses it, and they they put the gigs up and you know, blah blah blah. So in the end, you know, it, it all helps. It all goes into the same pot. But what's yeah. nice about it is that you can hit directly people that are actually interested in you, in hearing from you, which is which is fantastic. And that's why I like yeah. the Patreon. When, when you said it, I was like, yeah. I don't think it's bad. I think that direct thing is good. I think a lot of artists that have been playing for many years jumping into that. I always feel a little like it's have, have like a perspective like i don't know is it feel like i'm doing something you know too much or if it's if i sell it out or whatever but to me it feels like the purest form of taking control of your music it feels like um everybody should have it on some level if they have stuff they want to talk about because that personal connection to your fans there's no filter you're straight in. right people you know? love that and i think it, yeah. it supports them even more and reinforces it and, and, and you know, if you, exactly and the people that, are, that join it and, and, and uh, contribute they're, they're directly helping the artist. There's no, right. it's not going anywhere else. It's not going to. If you hit a couple, company. you know, a thousand people that, yeah. you know, a thousand people in your fan base, whatever, every year has yeah. X amount of stuff. Yeah. And you focus on that group. Yeah. You will make the money there off a thousand people, off you would just shooting buckshot all around, trying to gather all over the place other people. Yeah. You get everybody. You focus on that main group. And you'll have a steady flow of income because they want to support yeah. you and, and you want to keep, is a, you know, it works together. So Absolutely. I mean, I, I had, I was trepidatious about it slightly because I thought I don't want to become too available, if you know what I mean. I mean, I don't, there's, a, there's a certain, well, there used to be the idea that there was a certain distance between the artist and the fan base and there's a certain mystery involved. And that, but the mystery is really, is, is really in the, in the songs, right. because you're just trying to cast a spell with the songs and it either works or it doesn't. But these days, the process and everything else, I'm quite happy to share all that. I mm. like all that, you know, I would have loved to have had the chance to have done that with some of the people that, that I loved when I was growing up. I don't think it, I don't think it dilutes it. I think it, right. I think it's, it's fascinating. So I get that, I get, you know, and I, and I quite enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, you get a, a legion of fans and it's the best for you. I mean, yeah. fans like it and there's nothing separate. You know, you're, you're an artist. I mean, yeah. how unapproachable do you want to be? I mean, there are artists that are like that. And, yeah, I can't uh, imagine Van Morrison doing it because he's a grumpy old sod, you know, but that's all right. Well, that's, but then you look at the, you know, the personality because some people just like talking to people, you know, they just yeah. want to do the art. But the other yeah. end is some people think they're better and they still get that whole star attitude, you know? Sure. Sure, yeah. I, I think I find that more on, I hate to say it, bands, pop bands from the 80s, actually, you know. Yeah, I think that may be true, you know, because that's, uh, I have to watch it in myself. And sometimes, you, you know, I strip that away because it's nonsense, you know. That, and the, the 80s was one was the last era where, the, where you really had that global pop phenomenon. You know, but I've talked to people that are you know, musicians and rockers and other types of music that were, that were actually bigger in the 80s. Yeah. Very approachable. 100% of the time. I very rarely find anybody that's not. I yeah. only have little bumps. And it also might be their handlers, too, for pop music yeah. in the 80s. They may be insulated, you know? Yeah. yeah. But you're doing the right thing. You're being accessible to everybody. And, and the fans are going to eat it up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't think it... I don't think it ruins the music. I don't think no. it ruins the process. I mean, there's still mystery in the music. There should be. There's still something there, you know, that, that those people would approach. But I'm not, you know, I, I'm happy to share those things. This is how I play this song and I'll show you my little tricks. If somebody showed me, the, you know, it's passing it on. It's I've seen artists do this and, and it, their, their fan base is stronger than ever. Yeah. You know, and, and they communicate with them and they it's, it's the you, best. you know, even the biggest artists, Bruce Springsteen, you know, writes a book and he, and he, I love this book. You know, I'm not a massive Springsteen fan. I like Bruce when he's like doing sort of Nebraska or Ghost of Tom Joe, not right. big, 
not big bombastic Bruce. Right. But I was fascinated by his by his run on Broadway, and later read his book, where he kind of demythologizes himself. You know, I'm, he's the guy that writes about living on the on the darkness on the edge of town and go, cars and girls, and yet the guys live right next to where he was born most of his life. You know, he's not that guy. It's yeah. a, it, you know. The idea, the idea that he's the blue collar, authentic voice of the blue collar worker is bullshit. Guy's never worked in his life, and he says this. So I love that. I love the fact that he's that he's he's not pretending anymore, you know, to be that. You know, and I actually made me even more interested in his music. That's very fair. That's actually that's a really good point. I mean, you put that out there. Once you're honest, you know, it's. There's nothing else. They just know where to go with up. The truth I mean. is, you know, John Keats, truth is beauty, beauty, truth, it will out. And the more truthful you are in some ways, the more the more fascinating it becomes. I mean, I loved Mark Bowden when I was young, but God, he talked bullshit. He just made up this mythology. He, in the way that Bob Dylan did, Bob Dylan made up his whole, you know, I was born here and I did this and it was all lies and all that. And that was the way it was in those days. You used to make it over. But there's nothing, you know, and that's fine. Dylan is a mystery, but then Dylan is really an actor. Dylan is a whole version, a whole bunch of different people. You know, which is fascinating in its own way, you know. So, but there's, the, you know, so there's room for all. There is, there is. Well, I want to thank you for giving us some time today and coming on the show. And uh, I want to encourage oh, everybody sure. to check out your soul stuff because there's great soul stuff. And obviously, everyone knows the older stuff. And but the new stuff you have out there is great. I know people don't always say, if you hear that, do you have any new music out? Like if people don't, if they don't hear on their same stupid top 40 radio station they've been listening to for 30 years. Yeah. They, they assume an artist has just vanished off the earth. Yeah. You know, instead of realizing with marketing, the music is elsewhere. Like yeah. literally you have the internet, you can't tell and look. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys have done like five or six more albums actually. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to speak to you. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, send me a